Welcome everybody, great to have you here in church this morning. I don't know about you, but I am more pumped than I've ever been in my life. I am so excited about what God's about to do. I believe that there's going to come a revival. I believe that there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit of God. I believe that God wants to stir up the gift that's on the inside of us. I believe that, that there's something happening in the realm of the Spirit all over the world. Not just here, not just there, but all over the world. There's going to come a move of God's Spirit. And so this morning I want to speak, speak about the, the purpose of the promise. God doesn't do anything by part. He doesn't do anything just for, to scratch our itch or to make us feel good. He has got a purpose and a plan in everything that he does. The book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. It has no end. It's the only book that doesn't finish with a, with a benediction. It's the only book that doesn't finish with an end. I believe it's still being written. There's a chapter in there on Wesley that's been written today. There's a chapter there on John G. Lake. There's a chapter there on Wigglesworth. There's a chapter there on Catherine Kuhlman. There's a chapter there on Kenneth Hagen, and there's a chapter there on us. Amen? If you believe it, I believe it's still being used today and written today. A lot of people believe that the uh, Spirit of God ceased with the apostles. But it says in Acts 2.39, it says, The promise is unto you and unto your children and uh, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many people believe that you're in that? I'm in there, you're in there, we're all in it together, amen. So as many as the Lord shall call, that's us in there. So let the wind of the Spirit, uh, let the wind of God's presence flow all over us today. I believe that there's a word, and I, and I praise, thank you, Ken, for that word that you brought this morning, because we've got to rise up. There's, there's got to come a breakthrough, and I believe that we're going to see it. So, Father, we're just asking you for the God of the breakthrough to come in a special way today. Lord, I'm praying that you'd smash through every stronghold of the enemy. Lord, we'd hear the chains hitting the floor. My God, that there would, people would be set free just in the atmosphere of your presence. Lord, that the anointing of a living God would, would come again all over us. Lord, that, that somehow or other the church would, would, would be a voice and it would be heard loud and clear. Father, I pray for a fresh infilling of your spirit. I pray, my God, for an encounter that would challenge us and change us forever. And for that, we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. Amen and amen. Last week, we spoke a little bit about Samson. I just want to go over a little bit because I want to continue. I didn't finish last week, but just like on the TV programs, when, uh, they, when it says to be continued, when you see the continue, they usually speak a little bit of what happened the week before. Amen? So I'm going to do that just for a little moment. But in Judges 13, uh, God uh, raised up this man to begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Uh, Samson is a type of the church. I believe that Samson speaks a lot about what we're going through right now. Uh, the church... You see, what happened to him is he let pride, he let lust, he let the world uh, get into him. He let the, those sort of things get, get, into it, get around his life. He got his eyes off the promises of God. Because God had a promise for his life. He said, you're going you're to deliver Israel. You're going to be the one that's going to begin it. But he got his eyes off that and he got his eyes on the things of the world and women and goodness knows what else started to get around him. Man that God raised up to deliver his people from the Philistines is now in captivity. He's consumed by them. If we lose our purpose, we will be overtaken by the world system. And look, church, if we're really, really honest, the, the church has been overtaken by the world system. It has been consumed by it. God's desire is to establish the kingdom of God on planet earth. And there's no devil, there's no power, there's, no, there's nothing that will stop God from fulfilling what his desire is. Do you believe that today? In, in Matthew 6, 9, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Samson's strength 
return to Him. And I believe that this is what's going to happen to the church. That's why I can believe with a, with a, with a confidence, with an enthusiasm, whatever you want to say, that the church will rise again, that the Spirit of God will come again. Just like Samson, as he was even blind and in captivity, but the Spirit of God came again on him. And he killed more in his last day than he did before. And I believe we're going to see greater victories than we've ever seen before in our life. We're going to see a greater manifestation of God's kingdom. I believe that as his strength came back, and that's what's going to happen in the church, God's promise uh, is going to be fulfilled, and we're going to see God's mighty hand. The church will fulfill God's plan. Do you believe that today? That's you and me. No matter what state it's in right now, no matter how we can look at it, whatever we see, I believe it's going to happen again. In Matthew 16, 18 and 19, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you believe that today? See, whatever Satan has bound, what this really means, whatever Satan has bound will be loosed. If you're bound, you can be loosed today. Amen? Jesus wants to set the church free. He wants to set us free. I want to just, just say to you again, when God says, and I will... He doesn't say that to trick us. He doesn't say that to con us. He doesn't say that so that we'll think, oh, well, you know, it might happen, but in the back of our mind, it'll never happen. We've got to get rid of the negative thoughts that get into the back of our mind. We've got to get rid of the, the thoughts that, that, that cloud us at times that because we're not seeing it right now, because we're not uh, experiencing things right now. You see, I believe that something's happened to the church in the last 20 or 30 years. I've got some people here today that were in our church when we started at the Big Pineapple and even at the Gatehouse. We saw a move of God's Spirit that was so amazing and so powerful. We saw people healed and delivered. We saw uh, people being born again. Just amazing, amazing miracles. But then over the last 20 to 30 years, I've seen a tremendous shift as the church has shifted away from the Spirit of God a lot of Pentecostal churches today would not even dare do what we did this morning and start a service speaking in tongues. They would not dare even pray or do something like that because they've drifted so far away. And I believe that there's somewhere or other we've got to raise up a standard against that. We've got to break that stronghold. And we're just one little, we're only one little smidgen of what God is doing on planet Earth today. We're just one little, one little speck of sand on the beach, perhaps. Because I believe that as I was praying the other day, God spoke to me. He said, Neil, there are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that are hungry and they're praying in the Spirit and they're crying out to God and they're believing for a revival fire to burn. It doesn't matter what state we're seeing ourselves in now. It doesn't matter. Sure, it does matter. I'm sad that we've got there, but if we realize that over the last 30 years, there's been a tremendous moving away from the Spirit of God, and the church has been consumed by world. It's been consumed by, by just people just wanting to, you know, for pleasure or goodness knows what else. There's cell groups that, that are meant to, there to, 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 to bring discipleship and different teachings and gatherings of people to fill them with the Spirit of God are becoming nothing more but that social groups. Friend, that social thing has got around us. It has consumed us. People speak more about the playground that they have for their children, and that is beautiful, and I love that. But if that's the criteria, man, we've failed. I believe the presence of God is more important than anything else. And I believe that there's a shift that's coming back. There's a shift that's coming back. And, and, and I believe just like Samson's hair, as it grew again, as it started to grow, and his power, he realized where his power came from. 
He realized that the power of God was the Holy Spirit. And church, never get your eyes off the Holy Spirit. Never get your eyes off Jesus Christ. Meditate daily on the cross of Calvary. See your Savior hanging on that cross. See Him there on a whipping pole, taking the, the stripes for your healing and your deliverance. Never, never, never. I am not allowing what's going on in my life at the moment for one minute to take my eyes off the power and the purpose of God's presence. Amen. I will not allow that because God is my source. He is my strength. And a and hundred years from now, who cares? But I want to say that a hundred years from now, if, the, if my prayers are being fulfilled, I'll be very, very happy. Amen. When Jesus says, I will, I want to say this, He will. He said, I will build my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth, whatever the Satan is bound, will be loose. And I, want to, I believe the captives will be set free. How do I change? How does the church change? How do we change? Because as we're all in this boat together. How many people want to really see a revival? How many people want to see your children born again and in the kingdom? How many people want to see a tremendous move of the Spirit where literally thousands upon thousands? Uh, look, I can look back to the gatehouse. I can look back to the pineapple shed. I can look back to that and see the altars filled with people giving their lives to Christ. Amen, Keith and Jenny were there. I can remember not everybody that came got healed, but most of them did. But we saw those sort of things. We saw the power of God. We saw the anointing. We saw people just being touched by God. It was an amazing thing. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm going to let my hair grow again. Amen. <laughs> we've got to, so in the realm of the Spirit, we've got to change. How can I change? There's a word that a lot of us don't like, but number one, we've got to repent. We've got the, the spirit of repentance. It's nothing, no good wearing, you know, neck to knee clothes or trying to act holy or goodness knows what. But the spirit of repentance. There's a difference about trying to do something and there's a difference when the spirit comes upon you. When the spirit of repentance comes upon you. It's a different thing. I believe that we'll fall to our knees. I believe that we'll start crying out to God in a different way. I believe that then God can get a hold of our hearts because you see, we cannot con God. He knows our, the intents of our heart. Not trying to milk God, not trying to milk a miracle, not trying to milk a little bit of somebody cares or something like that. It's got to be real, and, and it's got to be between you and God. Number one, I believe, is repentance. He repented for his sin. He repented for the way he lived and the way he did things. And he started to, the second thing he did, he started to cry out to God. You know, one of the things that's concerned me more about this COVID thing is what it's done to the church. What it's done to the church. Before COVID came, we, had, we were doing between 40 and 50 people to our prayer meeting. Now we can get 10. Friends, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I want to encourage you to come to the prayer meeting on Tuesday night. Start to break that stronghold. Start to break that thing that, that says you don't have to go. Break that thing that says this or that, whatever it might be. Break it. Cyril spoke to me a couple of weeks ago and he said, I, I don't drive at night anymore. But that Tuesday, next Tuesday night, he was in the prayer meeting. I said, thank goodness that you didn't take any notice of that anymore. I thought you didn't drive at night. See, you've got to break those rot rotten strongholds that get into your mind and say things to you. Oh, yeah, 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 but come on, you've got to bust through sometimes. Do something that's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, Will it cost you? Yes, it will cost you. It'll cost you an hour. Might, oh, well, it takes me a half an hour to get there. I tell you what, if there's a special on at cold, you'd be there quick. 
See, this is where, where we can begin to cry out to God. Cry out to God and pray. Jesus wants us to pray, amen. Wants us wants to hear his people crying out to him. Samson began to cry out to God. He realized where his power came from. Friend, it won't happen while we're just singing Sarsara or whatever it is. It won't happen while we're hoping for it. it won't happen while we're, we're just thinking, well, perhaps somebody else will do it. Tom and Deb will be there, praise God. Neil will be there. Nancy will be there. Somebody else will be there. No, we've all got to be there. Amen? Oh, it's gone very quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> we've got to be able to do, understand where our power comes from. This church will not be built without prayer. Renew in me a passion for you. Breathe on the coals of my heart. Let your fire burn. Oh, shakabundi. Renew in me a passion for you. Breathe on the coals of my heart. Let the fire burn. I want to tell you what will change us, what will bring about a revival. Passion for Christ will cause the coals of my heart to burst into flame again. Passion for Christ will cause the coals of my heart to burst into flame again. How many people want the coals of your heart burst into flames? Come on. Leave me a wave if that's you today. Come on, let's, come on, say, God, breathe on me again. Breathe on me. Let that passion burn in me. God, let the passion for you burn in me again. Stir me again, my God. Stir me again. Passion, passion. Hunger. Hunger. Hunger for revival will bring about a revival in our own lives. Hunger for a revival. I want to see revival. Anybody, that's what drives me. That's what drives me. I want, I want to see a revival. Amen. For goodness sake, everybody say, hey. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, you're out there. Hunger, hunger, hunger. Hunger, hunger will drive me for revival. Hunger for revival will do something tremendous in our lives. We need a fresh encounter in our lives. Passion and hunger for truth. Passion and hunger for the Word of God. Passion and hunger for the, for the presence of God. Passion and hunger for the anointing. For the anointing. That will bring about change. There's three things we must continually remind ourselves. I find myself that I've got to continually remind myself of things. Otherwise, you get overtaken. If you haven't got your eyes on the finish line, you won't make it. You'll get overtaken. I saw a guy in a, one of those push bike races, and they race for hundreds of kilometers, massive uphills, downhills, Goodness knows what else. And this man was going for his life and he thought he'd won the race and he stopped pedaling and threw his hands in the air and as he did, the other bloke overtook him and won the race. He beat him by about that much of a tire. I don't want to be beaten by that much of a tire. I don't want to be beaten by the enemy, amen. I want to see him beaten up. So there's three things you've got to remind yourselves of. The purpose for Jesus the Christ coming to planet Earth was not just to get you and me to heaven. It wasn't just to get us to heaven. 1 John 3, 8 says this. It says, For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest, that He might destroy the works of Satan. 
You know, there's a lot of things we don't understand at times. We don't understand things that are going on. Because God moves in mysterious ways and He doesn't do things always the way we think He should do things. See, when Samson came on the planet and Samson's mother had been spoken to by an angel and says, he's coming and you know he's going to begin to deliver Israel. So she thought that she just had a holy child. She thought that this child was just going to be so reverent and so wonderful and just so full of the power of God and so full of grace and mercy. She got the shock of her life when he went down to the Philistines' camp and he saw a girl down there and he came back to his mum and dad and said, get her for me. And they said, oh man, come on, no, you, you gotta, you, 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 you're the one. <laughs> you got to get a girl from here, you, you, from our tribe. No, you don't go down to the enemy's camp. But the Bible says that God was seeking an occasion to come against the Philistines. And see, sometimes we don't understand what's going on around us, but if you don't have your eyes on Jesus, you'll, you'll fall into the trap. And you see, what happened there is you know that, that uh, he had a riddle and the, the, this girl told these guys and he made a bet of 300, I think it was, raiments of clothes. And uh, anyhow, she told them the riddle and he lost the bet. So he had to go and get 300 raiments of clothes. So what he did was he went and killed 300, oh, no, 30 rather, or 36 or something, Philistines and took all their clothes off him and then gave him, paid his debt. Not a bad way to pay your debt. <laughs> but you see, what you've got to, and I've got to understand is God is seeking occasion to move against the Philistines. And that, if you want to reference it, it's in Judges 14, verse 4. The purpose for God sending the Holy Spirit to the church was not so as that we just speak in tongues. It says, the purpose, I believe in Acts 1.8, you shall receive power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and other Witnesses of my power. See, I believe that God wants to come again in power. He wants to fill His church with power again. But you see, that's not just the person standing behind the pulpit. That's for every one of us. Every one of us have got to stir ourselves instead of sitting back thinking, well, praise the Lord, the leadership, the elders, this one, that one, they'll do it. No, no. You see, you've got to stir yourself. And you've got to start believing yourself. You've got to start believing that God wants to use you, that God wants to empower you. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you just didn't get tongues, you got power. It's funny that this doesn't say, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you on the day of Pentecost, you shall receive tongues. It says you shall receive power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Your power, I believe, is, a, is very, very important. It also says in John 16, 13, it says the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you into truth. There's a lot of us need truth. As Tom says, you know, people, that what he said there about, about his relative or friend that thinks that the world's going to run out of oxygen, there are other people in the church that have got such just as stupid of ideas. And we, we've, we've, got, there's, we've got to find the truth, amen. We've got to find what's really, really true. And number three is the purpose of the believer, the church. What's our purpose on this planet? Hallelujah, brother God. No, 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 no. More than that, the purpose of the believer, the church, I, I believe is to maintain the kingdom of God on earth till he returns. To maintain the kingdom of God on this earth to tend the garden right in the very beginning when God created the heavens and the earth and He put Adam and Eve in there, the thing that He said to Adam is, look after it. Watch over it. Look after what I've, what I've given. 
And we've got to look after the kingdom, bring the kingdom back in this earth. Mark 16, verse 15. See, we're, we're not spectators waiting for God to do it. It says, uh, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe uh, will be condemned. Verse 17, and listen to this, and these signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out demons. In my name they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I want you to give me a wave if you're a they. Come on, give me a double wave if you're a they. Let me, how about we get a bit of wind going in this place? These signs, give me a wave if you're a believer. <laughs> These signs will follow those that are waving. <laughs> Not this or that, you and me. you got to get up off your blessed assurance and start believing and start trusting and start speaking in tongues and start laying hands on somebody. Go out and find somebody. Lay hands on the sick. Do something in Jesus' name, amen. These signs will follow them that believe. Let me just say it again. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those that were waving. Who believe in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with other tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt you. They lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We are not on this planet just to accumulate wealth and have a good life. Well, I thought I'd get an amen from that. Jesus came to take back what was stolen in the garden. Number one thing that was stolen was relationship. Everybody say relationship relationship with Him. God Almighty. Sometimes when I'm praying or just sitting in my chair or whatever I might be doing, I just sort of meditate and I start to think about the majesty of my Creator and who He is and, 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 and that He, that one, wants to have a friendship with me. And as you meditate on that and as you start to muse on those sort of things, somehow or other, you, you start to get out of the natural into the, into the spirit and you start to see things. And, and, and though in the natural, when I think of that in the natural, I think I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough for that God who's so awesome and so wonderful. I'm not good enough for Him to even say hello to me. But you see... When I get in, as I get to meditating on that, and you get out of the natural and you get into the spirit, all of a sudden you feel God's presence come all over your life. And all of a sudden, that thing that, that I'm not accepted, that I'm not worthy, that I'm not good enough, all of a sudden it starts to melt away, and you just float into His presence and you just start to reach out and you rejoice. Hallelujah. Because His presence gets around your life. See, that doesn't happen while you're watching television. It doesn't happen when you're watching when a girl, girl marries or whatever it is. It might for you, I don't know, it didn't for me. God wants to establish relationship. Can everybody say relationship? Relationship with his people. That's what he craved when he came down in the garden in the cool of the evening. He came down to have relationship, to have a friendship. 
That's the whole reason I believe that we're on this planet. He wants people. He wants a family. Just like I want a family. I want to see my family in heaven. I want to see my family happy. And I want to see my family rejoicing. I want to see that happening. But you see, it's a thing of the Spirit. It's a relationship. And I believe number two is he came to reestablish the kingdom of God on planet Earth. He did this by giving his life a ransom for you and me. You meditate on that for a little while. You just meditate on that, what Jesus did to save me. You just meditate on that and you'll fall in love with him again. See, salvation is not a doctrine, it's a reality. You just start thinking about how much he loved me that he died for me. Start thinking and meditating on that and you'll just fall in love with him. You watch him suffering. He paid the ransom, paid with his life, gave his life. See, he didn't balk at the cross. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Saw Neil, he saw Nancy, he saw you and me. He saw us there. Thank God today the grave couldn't hold him, amen. Praise God the grave couldn't hold him. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. He arose, the victor from the dark domain. He arose, the victor. After the resurrection, Matthew 28, 18, uh, 18 and 19, Jesus came and spoke to them, I think, Tom spoke about this. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. See, if we lose the purpose of the promise, all we become is just tongue talkers. And even now that's fading away. There'll be many Christians today, Pentecostal Christians, that don't even speak in tongues from one day to the next. Jesus carried this authority all through his ministry on earth. In Acts 10.38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went around doing good and healing all who were abreast of the devil because God was with him. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good because God was with him. Friends, somehow or other, Jesus said, these things that I do, you can do also. And the only way we can do it is by the Holy Spirit. And you've got to do this, you've got to put this, how God anointed Neil Myers from Townsville with the Holy Spirit and with fire or power who went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. You gotta put your name in there. You gotta you gotta say, you gotta be bold, you gotta push through. God has anointed you, amen. You are anointed vessels. God wants to do more than we could ever imagine. How much time have I got? Am I doing okay here? Got another ten minutes. I want you to open up your Bibles if you would. I've got all these others written down, but I want to read this one to you. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. It says, Then they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And there was a man there in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What are we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And he rebuked him. He said, Be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean spirit uh, convulsed him, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commanded even unclean spirits, and they obeyed him. 
And I want to tell you, there's going to come some changes in the church. And God's going to start doing some things that are unusual. Amen. He's going to start doing things. But here he is, Jesus turns up and he starts to move with, with power and with authority. And the, and the people there, they, they recognize this authority. Verse uh, uh, Luke, have a look in Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 10. And after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city, every place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out uh, laborers into the harvest. Verse 8. Uh, whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And it says, heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. So here he is, he's sending out laborers. These were just ordinary people, people just like you and me. And then it goes over here and it says in verse 17, it says, then he said, sorry, in verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to you, to us in your name. Friend, you'll be amazed if you start to go in the power of the Holy Ghost. Some people are waiting. They're saying, I'm waiting for this, I'm waiting for that. I said, you don't have to wait anywhere. He's already said to you in the book, go. Go into all the world. These signs will follow you when you go. Well, I'm waiting for the signs. No, they follow. They don't go before you. They follow you when you go. That's what faith is, stepping out, moving into something, going for it, having a go. The 70 return, return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And they said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in, the, in heaven. Amen. Do you believe that today? Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I saw Satan fall. Nothing can harm us. Fear can't hurt you. Devil's works can't hurt, hurt you when you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. We need the armor of God, which you find in Ephesians 6.11. I hear a lot of Christians say, I get up every morning and I put on the armor. I do this and I do... Friend, it is not a ritual. You cannot put the helmet of salvation on if you don't know you're saved. You can't put on the armor of God. You can't put, on, put the, 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 feet, the shoes on your feet to go out and preach if you haven't prepared in the Word of God. You, you can't do these things. It's not just a matter of going to your wardrobe and putting on clothes because that seems just so, so natural. This has got to be the spirit of it. When, you, when you're putting on the helmet of salvation, man, you've just got to believe it and you've got to confess it and you've got to understand it and you've got to see it. The blessed breastplate, you've got to put on the armor, whatever it is you're putting on. You've got to know why you're putting it on and you've got to pray it through and, and get the victory on it in Jesus' name. In Ephesians 3.19, we need to be filled with the fullness of God. Make sure you're under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. There's a song we used to sing, stirring up deep, deep wells. The deep of God, I believe, is crying out to the deep inside of you. Will you respond to it? Stir up the gift. It's time to rise, to rise, shine. Rise up, you people of power. Make a stand. Draw a line in the sand. Be bold. Be renewed. Be renewed in God. And renew a passion in me. Renew a passion in me. I have the musos come back. Hallelujah. Renew in me a passion for you. Breathe on the coals of my heart. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. 
Oh, shaka bundi. I feel better now. Koka shaka bundi. Why don't you somebody have a little talk in tongues? Ura baranda rana masura baranda. Kibarai rabara. Stir up, stirring up deep, deep wells. Stirring up deep, deep wells. Stirring up, stirring up, stirring up. Roy, there's a stirring going on on the inside of you. There's a stirring that's beginning to stir on the inside of you. Oh, Roy, it's your moment. It's your time to rise up. It's your time to rise up and start to speak. Start to speak it out in Jesus' name, Roy. Start to speak it out. It's time to break the chains that hold us bound. I would be telling you, Fibs, if I said to you that throughout my Christian life, it's just been a breeze. I've just been tiptoeing through the tulips with tiny Tim. It's just been so, so easy. I've never had a problem. I would be telling you fibs. But I'll tell you there's times when I've had to stand. And when I've done all the stand, I've just kept standing. Perhaps right now is a similar time. But I want to tell you, friends, we're not going to let anything overtake us. We're going to overtake it. The church, I believe, is our finest hour. It's our time, but we've got to learn to be able to respond. We've got to learn to be able to yield. I know as a Christian many times and the Spirit of God was speaking to me, I'd be hanging onto the chair in front of me. Thank goodness they are at one point something a meters apart and you can't get hold of the chair today. But I'd be holding onto the chair, my knuckles would be going white. Because I knew God was talking to me, God was wanting to do something in my life, but I, somehow or other I didn't really want it. Perhaps it might, might have been total ignorance. Might have been pride. I don't want people to think that I'm not all there. As I, what, my, every one of us has got different reasons. But I found that God is a good God. People say God is a good God and it's just a phrase. But God is a good God. And is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And I found that I had to let go. One time when Nancy and I were out in our boat during the Whit Sundays, she fell off the back of the boat. It was just on dusk and I just told her we'd seen other people swimming. And I said to Nancy, I said, they're, they're stupid. She said, why? I said, this is the time when there's sharks on dusk. And she fell in the water. Well, she put her hand up, but she put her finger somewhere or other in the in the ladder, so they were still up. She got a finger in the hole of the ladder and started to bleed. And I, I couldn't get her up. But she's in the water and next minute made it worse. I saw these two feet coming up. I don't know how she did it. The feet come up. I said, <laughs> She doesn't want her feet bitten bit off. The feet come up in the air like that. And I'm looking at her. I said, Nancy, you're going to have to let go. She said, I'm not letting go. I said, let go so I can help you. I don't know what she felt. A little mullet might have swam past. <laughs> but all of a sudden, she let go and I could pull her up. But you see, if we don't let go, of our pride and our wrong thinking, and wrong attitudes, and wrong, 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 wrong. If I go out there, he's going to push me over. Well, I might. I'm not saying I haven't. I surely have from time to time. If I get excited, I jump on people. I headbutt people. I do anything, haven't I, Keith? I've mostly headbutted you a few times draw a circle on their belly and headbutt them. I'll do anything to try to help people. 
That's all I want. I just want to help people. I just want to help you to break through, to break into what God has for you. We're going to sing this song, Renew and Me, a passion for you. Is that what we're singing? That's it, isn't it? Yeah. Let's stand to our feet. And that, friend, if you're here today and you know, you know, I, I need a stirring. I, I need something just... Would you, would you let go? And would you let God help you? Because you see, whether you know it or not, and I'm including me in this motley bunch, <laughs> this is what he's got. This is it, amen? This is us. This is who he wants to work with. And he will if you let him. But we're just going to sing it. Renew in me. You want God to do that? Just slip out of your seat. Come out. A passion for you. Let God touch you. Bring on the coals of my heart. Let the fire. just want your presence around our lives want to give ourselves to you afresh want to give ourselves to you Jesus we just give ourselves in Jesus name amen and amen